uh, Professor John for your kind introduction. Uh, I will be presenting a paper, I think much different from the presentations this morning. It will be focusing on the notion of nationalism based on our experience in the Philippines. So the title of my paper is The Ambivalence or the Ambiguity of Nationalism, the Philippine Experience. First of all, uh, just a short uh, explanation on how the notion of nationalism will be understood in this presentation. So there are three senses that nationalism is understood in this paper. The first one is nationalism in the context of national identity, that is the identity of a people. Then the second is nationalism as protecting the national interest against foreign influence, a nation first policy. The third is nationalism as an internal agenda that counters economic and social inequality among the people, provides equal opportunity for the people and promotes social justice. And I would say that in the Philippine experience, these senses of nationalism bear some forms of ambiguity and ambivalence. They're ambiguous because such notions are open to different interpretations and narratives. And second, ambivalent because they generate conflicting attitudes and perceptions. Now the first topic is nationalism and the Filipino national identity. Who is the Filipino and what is the identity of the Filipino nation? In order to understand this notion of Filipino national identity or sense of it, we have to go back to the history of the Filipinos from the pre-colonial period, the colonial, and up to the present time. And I will take you to a brief overview of our history. First is the pre-colonial period. This is the period before the coming of the Spaniards in 1521. Before the Spanish came to this vast archipelago of more than 7,000 islands located at Southeast Asia, there was no Filipino nation to talk about. Um, because what would later be called a Filipino nation is an archipelago of warring, different scattered and warring tribes headed by their local king or the Datu. Uh, sorry. So, early in its pre-colonial history, the natives traded with the Chinese and the Indians, and later accepted Islamic religion through which Islamic sultanates, some of which are still existent in the south, part of the country in Mindanao. Next is the colonial period. The Spanish came in the fourth century. Ferdinand Magellan arrived in 1521, but it was the arrival of Miguel Lopez de Legazpi in 1565 that made significant impact on the lives of the natives. The Spanish named archipelago Islas Filipinas, in honor of King Philip of Spain. The Spanish conquered the natives through the sword and the cross. The conquest by cross resulted in the conversion of the Filipinos to Christianity. The Spanish religious orders, Augustinians, Dominicans, Franciscans, Jesuits, and early in the early religious orders in the Philippines established not just parishes, but schools from primary to tertiary level educating the Filipinos not just in the Spanish political and social life, but in the Christian doctrines. The Spanish ruled the Filipinos for four centuries, supplanting the pre-colonial culture and practices of the natives. There are certain parts, however, in the Philippines, which were able to resist Spanish rule, most notably the South, which retained their Muslim religion and culture. The Americans came at the end of the 19th century with the outbreak of the Spanish-American War in 1898. But through the Treaty of Paris in 1898, the Spanish ceded the Philippines to the Americans and began a half century of American colonial period. The Americans introduced its political and social system and opened the public schools with English as the medium of instruction. While at the beginning the Filipinos were quite suspicious of the Americans, they would later embrace the American ideals and system, and the Filipinos would be regarded as little brown Americans, looking up to Uncle Sam for protection. In 1941, 
With the outbreak of World War II, the Japanese Imperial forces invaded the Philippines and occupied the country until the end of the war in 1946. The Japanese occupation only lasted for three years, but it committed the war's atrocities against the Filipinos. Maybe you have heard about comfort women during the Spanish, or during the Japanese um, uh, occupation. The Japanese forces were finally defeated and driven out in 1946, but not after leaving Manila in total ruins because of the fierce battle between American artillery and the Japanese ground forces. American influence, however, will continue after, even after the war. The post-colonial period. It is difficult to determine when the colonial period in the Philippines ended. While the Philippines gained independence from Spain on June 12, 1898, uh, uh, up to this, up this time, we are all still celebrating our independence every June 12. But we were immediately ceded by the Spanish to the American in the same year. The Americans, while granting partial independence to the Philippines through certain legislations, which led to the establishment of the Commonwealth government in the Philippines. The Philippines was still under the direct rule of the Americans until we were granted independence, the second independence from a colonial power, on June 4, 1946. But even after the declaration of independence from the Americans, we were still struggling to break free from the American colonization. Nationalist Filipinos opposed the continued presence and influence of America to the Philippine society, especially in terms of economic, political, and even military affairs, calling for the dismantling of this American imperialism. The leftist movement, inspired by the Marxist ideals, has been very critical of the American influence and presence in the Philippines, and has been waging war, waging war against the government. It could be the longest armed struggles, one of the longest armed struggles in the world. From the colonial period up to the post-colonial, there is a continuing struggle for national identity and economic sufficiency and political independence. After a long and arduous process of colonization, first by the Spaniards, then by the Americans, and then briefly by the Japanese, which overshadowed our pre-colonial culture and practices, there is still an ongoing debate and discussion as to what constitutes the Filipino national identity. Filipinos are still trying to discover the genuine Filipino national identity. What truly constitutes our national identity? Up to what extent can be considered as genuinely Filipino? We recognize that we are a result of a mix of ethnic Filipino elements coming from our pre-colonial period and foreign elements. And we are a breed of an ethnic culture the culture of the colonizers. But there is always a lingering question, who is the real or genuine Filipino? Is a genuine Filipino identity that which is untainted by colonial influences or that which has been modified and transformed by our colonial influence? Because of our colonial past, we have often burdened with the baggage of colonial thinking, which to some extent has been translated into total dependence and a critical acceptance of colonial ideas and prescriptions. Most Filipinos would have the tendency to favor the foreign ideas and things over the local ones. Most Filipinos love foreign culture. They would love to eat foreign foods, wear foreign clothing, use foreign tools, read foreign books, and even listen to foreign music, watch foreign movies and shows, and appreciate foreign arts and even literature. This is the ambiguity and ambivalence of our national identity. While we want to protect, project a national identity, there is always a lingering question as to the real national identity of the Filipino. The next point is the ambivalence of our foreign policy. Due perhaps to the long colonial rule and to the geographical location of the Philippines, which put it at the crossroads of geopolitical activities, in that area of the world, our foreign policy has been ambivalent. For more than a century, the Philippines has been under the influence of the Americans. This influence is maintained or manifested in the bilateral relations established between the Philippines and the U.S. through the various treaties and agreements between the two countries. First, 
were the military-based agreements from 1947 until 1991 when the U.S. was allowed to maintain military bases in the Philippines. The most notable are the two largest military bases outside of the U.S. during those years, namely the Clark Air Base and the Subic Naval Base. The military agreements or base agreements were supplanted by the Visiting Forces Agreement and the annual military exercises between the Ameri American and Filipino troops. There is also the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement between the two countries. And there are also the security agreements which would allow the United States to help boost the capacity of the Philippines to patrol their own waters, including the disputed Spratly Islands in the West Philippine Sea, or what I would call the South China Sea, and help the Philippines in its war against terrorism. Aside from this, there are several trade and investment agreements between the two countries. The U.S. is traditionally the largest foreign investor in the Philippines. And for a long time, the U.S. and the Philippines has been allies in many aspects of social and political affairs. Past Philippine administrations has maintained a long relation, strong relation with the U.S. to the point that at some, to the point that some, at some points we have been subservient to the U.S. interests. However, when President Rodrigo Duterte, the present president now, formally assumed office on June 30, 2016, the whole landscape of the Philippine-American diplomatic relations drastically changed. The U.S.-Philippine relations began to sour. The drift between Duterte and Obama can be attributed to the concern that the then U.S. President Obama expressed over the human rights issues about President Duterte's war on drugs and criminality. President Duterte could go, would go on cursing the U.S. government, or even Obama personally, the U.N., the EU, every time that they, these foreign entities expressed concern over human rights violation. President Duterte has always been critical of the presence of the Americans and has always expressed that he wanted the Americans out of the country. At one point, he suggested that American Special Forces would have to cease its operations in leave Mindanao, the southern part of the country, home to Filipino Muslims. He cited the killings of Filipino Muslims during the U.S. pacification campaign in the early 1900s, which he claimed were at the root of the long restiveness of the minority Muslims in a largely Catholic nation's nation in the South. He explicitly expressed that he wants to end to the, to end to the Philippines' joint military exercises with the United States. But he added that he will continue to uphold the Philippines' treaties with the U.S. Ironically, President Trump had praised President Duterte's war on drugs even congratulating the president for doing a great job against illegal drugs. The Duterte administration is warming up with China and has shifted its foreign policy to China despite the fact that the Philippines has a dispute with China regarding the Spratly Islands in the South China Sea or in the West Philippine Sea. And China continues to militarize the region by constructing structures which could be used for military purposes. President Duterte would not take with China the permanent court arbitration ruling in favor of the Philippines, which invalidates China's Nindas Line in the South China Sea or in the West Philippine Sea. There's a China uh, put a, a Nindas Line uh, along the coast of the Philippines, making this uh, uh, part of the uh, Spratly Islands part of the territory of of China. And the, uh, the ruling of the arbitration favored the Philippines, invalidating that claim of China. The Duterte administration is also shifting its foreign focus to Russia. President Duterte has openly expressed his admiration for President Putin. While the majority of Filipinos are still looking up to the U.S., as there are more Filipinos in the U.S. than in any other countries, the tirades of the president against international entities like the UN, the US, and the EU has put, has, not put, has put not just the foreign policy of the Philippines 
in a very unstable position. It has, in fact, affected the standing of Filipinos in many countries, especially in the U.S. and in the EU or in, the U in Europe. Majority of Filipinos still have a low approval and trust rating of China as compared to the U.S., which continues to hold high trust and approving approval ratings among the Filipinos. After assume office, Duterte announced that he will pursue an independent foreign policy. And this generated a debate as to what he meant by such policy, especially in the context of the Asia-Pacific region, where there is a third attention in the South China Sea or the West Philippine Sea, given the disputes of these islands. The Philippine ambassador to China, Ambassador Santa Romana, explained that the overall context of such independent foreign policy is emerging regional power shift in the Asia-Pacific. He argued that we are seeing right now the rise of a power in Asia and the decline of another power that used to dominate the region since the end of the Second World War. He considered China not as a superpower, but as a major regional power. He noted that the countries in the region have felt China's rise as it seeks to expand power and influence in the region, especially in the South China Sea. There are three major elements of the third day administration independent foreign policy at this point. First, the separation of Philippine foreign policy from the U.S. But this does not mean total cutting off from the U.S., but lessening Manila's independence or dependence on Washington while maintaining the historic alliance between the Philippines and the U.S. Second is an independent foreign policy that requires improvement relations with China. And third, the improvement of relations, of relations with non-traditional partners like Russia, Japan, and India. The underlying reason for this shift in foreign policy of the Duterte's administration is Duterte's claim of nationalism. He claims that we have long been under the colonial rule, especially by the Americans, so it is high time that we take care of our own and that these foreign interests or of these other states and entities have to leave the Philippines to charter its own course. He wanted to promote an independent foreign policy, and by that he means a po foreign policy that is determined solely by the interests of the Filipinos. He wanted to promote the interests of the Filipinos and protect them from the interests of other foreign entities. But while he harps on this independent foreign policy, he has also tied up the Philippines to other countries and has undermined the good relations that the country enjoys with the other countries, particularly the U.S. and the EU and even the U.N. and have also compromised the claims of the Philippines to this, to this practice. While Duterte's claim of nationalism is the main reason for such policy, to a larger extent it models the whole discourse or narrative on nationalism because it undermines the Philippine relations with other foreign entities with his tirades and offensive criticisms of, this, of those who are against his foreign policy and his war against criminality. So, from one colonial power, we attach ourselves to other power which is poised to exert a similar influence to the country. So the question is, what nationalist narrative is he trying to propose? This is the ambivalence and ambiguity of the present Philippine foreign policy as a pretext of nationalism. It is good to have an independent foreign policy that secures and protects the interests of the country from the interests of others. But if by independent or a nationalist foreign policy would, see, would mean simply changing alliances, that only generates more ambiguity and ambivalence in that policy. The third, nationalism and the quality of life of the people. In 1910, Theodore Roosevelt made a strong case for a new nationalism that promotes the protection of human welfare and rights, regulates the economy, and guarantees social justice. In the Philippines, past administrations have boasted of the economic gains during their respective tenures. However, there are more Filipinos who are still living in poor living conditions. The Philippine Statistics Authority reported that the poverty incidence among Filipinos in 2015 was estimated at 
although an improvement from 19 or 20, 20, 2012, which was at 25%. While these statistics may look good, that means in concrete terms, there are five Filipinos. No? Uh, there, are, there are one out of five Filipinos who were poor in 2015. That is roughly 21.9 million out of the 100 million Filipinos living in poverty. According to the Asian Development Bank report in, 19, in 29, 2009, the main causes of poverty in the Philippines are low to moderate economic growth for the past 40 years, low growth elasticity in poverty reduction, weakness in employment generation and equality of jobs generated, failure to fully develop the agriculture sector, high inflation rates or high inflation during crisis periods, high levels of population growth, high and persistent levels of inequality in terms of incomes, that dampen any positive impacts of economic expansion and the recurrent shocks and exposure to risk like economic crisis, conflict, and even natural disasters. The same report said that economic growth did not translate into poverty reduction in the recent years, meaning the figures are good, but it does not trickle down to, to the marginalized. While a country has experienced moderate economic growth in recent years, Poverty reduction has been slow. Inequalities remain high, which mitigates the positive impact of growth on poverty reduction. Chronic poverty has become a major constraint in attaining high levels of sustained growth and countries' overall development. Now, so this nationalist discourse of President Duterte is connected to this program of improving the lives of the people. His political slogan during the campaign was, change is coming. Change is coming, which should be translated as, our life will improve. This is aimed at improving economic and social life of the ordinary and poor Filipinos who for so long has been mired in poverty. While other experts claim that the main cause of poverty is slow economic growth, weak employment generation, failure to develop agriculture, high population growth, high level of economic inequality, President Duterte claims that the main cause of these social ills of the country is attributed to the problem on drugs and criminality. Hence, he enlists an aggressive and brutal war on illegal drugs, which has claimed since he assumed office more than 7,000 victims. Most of them were executed extrajudicially. Judicially. The statistics would show that the victims of this brutal war on drugs are mostly the poor who cannot even air their sides, much less defend themselves in courts. To focus and contain the cause of the social ills in a country, the crime and illegal drugs, is to miss the bigger picture. The Filipinos are always vulnerable to risk, not just environmental disasters, but even more to financial risk and security risk. And security concern is highlighted with escalating and unresolved conflict in Mindanao, the southern part of the Philippines, home to Muslim Filipinos, some of whom has been fighting the government for greater autonomy in some wanted to establish a moral state. At the moment, the war in Marawi City, if you are familiar with what's happening in the south of the Philippines, there's an ongoing war between government forces and a terrorist group called Mounty Group. It's been raging for more than a month. The Duterte administration responded to this conflict by declaring martial law in Mindanao. And the president has even threatened that he might declare martial law in the whole of the country. Such declarations has caused anxiety to the majority of Filipinos who had a terrible experience of martial law in the 70s and 80s during the administration of, Philip, of President Marcos. Now, the different narratives of nationalism in the Philippines. The history of the Philippine presidency and administration and this has been marked by a cycle of regime narratives that more or less defines their notion of nationalism. This cycle has been expressed through what one expert would call regime narratives or the governing script 
that binds together a coalition of interests within a particular institutional context. And there are four dominant regime narratives in the history of the Philippine presidency and administration. First is the narrative of unfinished revolution. That's the nationalist narrative. It's a narrative after the Spanish colonization during the Commonwealth period and during the second or the end of the Second World War. The, the, the narrative focuses on continuing the revolution from colonial powers. The second narrative is the narrative of a great nation. Some others would call it the de developmentalist narrative, which was a logical continuity to the unfinished revolution narrative during the earlier period. And this is centered on nation building, development, and modernity. The third is the narrative of good governance or reformist, which is a counter narrative to the developmental authoritarianism during the Marcos regime. During the Marcos regime, wanted to develop the nation, uh, modernize the nation, but he did this by way of authoritarianism. So the next narrative is a, a, a good governance narrative, a reformist narrative. And the last one is, or the fourth one, is the narrative of the masa. Masa means the people. So it's a populist narrative that appeals to the common people and claims close affinity to the people. And to some extent, this is the narrative of Duterte. Okay? It's a narrative that attempts to address you know, the, uh, the poverty of the Filipinos. You know? But if you look at this, this is a narrative that is often abused and misused, taking, you know, uh, taking advantage of the, Filipino, of, the Filip of the people. Obviously, President Duterte's narrative is a populist one. His discourse of nationalism is centered on a populist agenda that offers good life to the people. However, as I've said, that agenda is often abused and misused. The question that can be posed is, what kind of a populist nationalism is he talking about? If he's, it's a kind of nationalism that hopes to counter inequality in terms of economic among the people, providing equal opportunity in promoting social justice, obviously it is not, at least at the very moment. There are more people who are poor, and if the economy is improving, it does not trickle down to the marginalized. Now my concluding remarks. The notion of nationalism in the Philippines has been, to some extent, both ambiguous and ambivalent. Given the many narratives of nationalism in the history of the Philippines, one can hardly find an underlying and sustained discourse except the sustained attempt to discover the identity of a nation and promote its interest. Perhaps this is common among the nations of the world, this search for identity. And perhaps for this reason, we can say that it is not, after all, totally ambiguous. The many narratives of nationalism in the country have also generated different attitudes and perceptions. In fact, the narratives that we have mentioned either counter each other or overlap each other. Filipino perceptions on a changing foreign policy have been varied, and some have become incredulous of this, what we might call, recent pivot to China, a declaration of the present administration that is going to appeal or going to be, uh, have more relationship with China. But perhaps one thing common is, again, the attempt to promote national identity and interest. The resurgence of nationalism, not only in Asia, but even in Europe, is an indication of the adverse reaction of people to globalization. As the losers in the borderless world attempt to win back their control of their respective national borders. According to one Philippine historian, in the Philippine setting, it can be, and I quote, inherently conflictual, caught between the dynastic colonial modes of apprehension on the one hand and the possibilities of an egalitarian post-colonial existence on the other. But that means, but that the means for imagining nationhood may at times be at odds with the very nature of the images that are produced. On a positive note, nationalism is one national anchor which people can use to preserve their national or their sense of national community, which globalization seeks to eradicate and could also be undermined by regional integration, like the EU, for example. 
Without a strong sense of national consciousness, we cannot confront the ideology of globalization, says one Filipino nationalist. With a strong sense of nationalism, we can take pride of our own identities and culture and be critical of the various ideas and prescriptions of other foreign interests by examining their impact, especially the negative ones, on our local, economic, social, political, and cultural realities. But it's striking a good balance between the nationalist ideals and the reality of globalization is more complex than we can imagine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. I open the floor. Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you. It was really uh, very educative to me. Uh, what struck me was this: um, how close you put the idea of nationalism with the idea of poverty, and the way in which politically, may I suppose. This narrative of nationalism is, in fact, a narrative for social justice or something like that, such as, you know, the pure uh, echantillon of the people is among the, are among the poor, the poorest people, you know. The richest people in any country, they are not exactly representative for the purity of the nation, you know. Always is about the poor. So, but this is, this is very interesting. And I'd like to, to, to ask you to elaborate a little bit on that, or a little bit more on that relationship between nationalism and social justice in, in, in Philippines. Okay, first uh, on the matter of uh, nationalism being tied up with poverty. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking from our, uh, maybe this is something foreign to you, but in, in the Philippine experience, poverty has always been part of, you know, the daily life of the Filipinos. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, there are 20, more or less 20 to 25 uh, percent of the Filipinos who are living in poverty. And of course, there are many factors contributed, uh, contributing to this, this reality. So when we talk of nationalism, uh, it's difficult, especially of the nationalist agenda of you know, improving the lives of people. This agenda of improving lives of people is always in the background, or we always have poverty as a kind of as a kind of background. And uh, and again, um, regarding the the the, the link between uh, nationalism and social justice, that's precisely the point. Uh, social justice will only be you know there will only be social justice in a particular society if. One, if we can alleviate poverty, because there's no such just social justice that we can talk about for as long as people are poor. And of course, uh, in my personal view, uh, people, uh, of course, President Duterte have used the illegal drugs as a case for you know for some of his policies. But when you look at it, people are hooked on drugs because of poverty. Those who sell drugs, they want to earn extra money. And those who buy drugs, they want to just forget the realities. So uh, poverty has always been associated with, with any, in the Philippines, with uh, a discourse about nationalism. But of course, uh, historically, the underlying factor of this is, I would say, and this would be also uh, the, the view of many Filipinos, that we have been under the colonial rule for so long. And it's always been the, at, the, at the background of any discourse on... And you know, poverty is a worldwide problem, you know? Yes. But in every country, it's assumed as a national problem, as a matter of national pride. We are poor. We have to get out of this poverty. This is part of our... It, it's interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Another question? I got one. No. This is a little bit technical, but how much is the lack of nationalism not just, well, to some extent it's a consequence of your two episodes of colonialism, but to how much of it is just a consequence of the diversity? Of, I mean, I remember in a previous session, John Paul showed us a map of the Philippines and all the different islands and all the different cultures. How much of it is just a consequence of that physical uh, reality of separating culture? Or do, or do most people in the Philippines in that, think of themselves as Filipinos? 
Okay. Uh, the the Philippine nation is com is as diverse as any other uh, any other country, I would suppose. Uh, just to give you uh, a kind of uh, uh, illustration, we have different dialects. For example, of course, we are predominantly you know we use Tagalog as the basis of our national language, but Tagalog, which we call the Filipino uh, language, is used by people in the in this in, in in Luzon. People in Central Philippines, like in the Visayas and in, in Mindanao, they don't use Tagalog because they would use their local dialect, like Cebuano or the, Visay the other Visayan dialects. So there are many languages or many dialects in, in the Philippines. You can imagine if you are staying in one town, the next town would have a different dialect. And then the next town would have a different dialect. So that's how diverse uh, the culture of the, Filip of the Filipinos. Now, um, given this, um, while, pe while the Filipinos would like to have that sense of national identity, they also recognize that they are also diverse in terms of culture, in terms of language, etc. And this has played a great, you know, uh, played a, a big factor in the Philippine political settings. Like for example, President Duterte is the first president to be elected out of Mindanao. Mindanao is the southern part of the Philippines. Most of our, Philipp of our president before the Tete either came from Luzon, which is the largest island in the Philippines, and then in the Visayas. So he takes pride in being elected the first president from, from that part of the country. And that part of the country is home to Filipino Muslims. So he, he sympathizes with the, the plight of, of the Muslims, of the Filipino Muslims in the South. Uh, it brings a different dynamics in this discourse of, of nationalism, this uh, diverse culture and this, you know. Uh, okay, a final question? Well, I have one, apropos of that, um, of your history. Uh, Duarte, Duarte cannot say, make the Philippines great again, right? I mean, there, there is no prior nation. Yeah, I there's mean, no again. There's no again, yeah. right? I mean, so this is what's unique. You know, it's, it's, it's Spain before the Reconquista. It's Italy before the Reggio It's America before the Indians were gone, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, an, it's a very different setting. Yeah. Okay, well, let's... Again, thank Professor for a stimulating conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, so yeah, I'll move there. I think for the you can sit over there, Professor, or you can go. I invite you all to stand up for a mini break if you need to. But um, we're going to move right ahead to our second presentation. This is Professor. Don't worry, we have plenty. Uh, this is Alex Tofan, who is a professor of philosophy here at the University of Yash. He is going to present his paper this afternoon on Seeing the Other, Hearing the Other, Pre-Modern and Post-Modern Communities. Professor Tofan. Thank you very much. My presentation today will be mostly philosophical, a philosophical analysis of a concept that I think is linked also to the broader topic, that of nation, nationalism, what is a nation state, and mostly to the round table of tomorrow, the one on migration. I want to speak about the concept of hospitality, and uh, I'll try to analyze it in relation to different political and cultural actors, that is, I will identify three main paradigma for that concept, uh, political uh, paradigma the nation state in a nation-state dominated world, an ethical paradigma in a globalized world, and uh, finally a few words about a possible spiritual paradigma in which uh, this concept can be developed. Uh, and uh, 
although it is a philosophical reconstruction of that concept, I will try to be as empirical as possible in order to to get attuned to the to the to the discussions before me. And I have some questions regarding this concept. What does it mean being hospitable? What is hospitality? Who can be most hospitable? Where to seek hospitality? And finally, third, is whether there are any limits to hospitality. And the first paradigm I will try to address briefly is a modern paradigm, a political paradigm of uh, hospitality developed by Immanuel Kant in a book, Perpetual Peace, a Philosophical Sketch from 1795. And uh, the main problem of Kant in that book is that men are from nature in a state of war. And it is the legal system, the, the law, uh, an instrument to, to, to prevent uh, the war as I said, given the fact that man is from nature in a state of war. And there are three levels of justice, of, of law, uh, on which, uh, Kant, uh, of which Kant speaks and could prevent this war. First of all, a national level. From this national, national level of law, Kant said the principle of every uh, law system at a le national level is that every constitution should be republican. So the, re the republicanism is, for Kant, uh, a way of uh, giving justice to everyone in an equal manner so that uh, the aggression could be uh, 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 stopped at any time against uh, each member of the society. The second uh, level of law is an international law. That is, the law of nations, uh, I, I, I addressed that in a question this morning, the law of nations should be founded on a federation of free states and not on a super state. And the argument of Kant is very, uh, so very briefly exposed is that in a nation there are some power balances which are uh, based on violence. For example, the police is violent when a citizen uh, drives his car too fast, or I don't know what. In order between the states not to exist this uh, violent uh, rela relationship, it should not, we should not speak about a state, but of a federation of states, and he gives a lot of uh, insights on what this federation should be like. What interests me is the third uh, level of law, a cosmopolitan law, a, lo a global law. And uh, at a cosmopolitan level, the third definitive article for a perpetual peace uh, is formulated by Kant, the law of world citizenship may be limit shall be limited to conditions of universal hospitality. This is a very paradoxical article in Kant. Because Kant said that uh, not being given a super state, uh, 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 but a federation of states, we cannot speak of a super citizenship, of, or of a global citizenship as such. Uh, but in terms of his uh, theoretical philosophy, the universal citizenship is a regulative, not a constitutive idea. It's something to be tended towards and not to be implemented actually in history. But what do we have instead of this universal citizenship? We have the law of hospitality. That is, uh, and I will uh, give a quotation to see how he formulates this hospitality law. And I will comment a little bit on that. Hospitality means the right of a stranger not to be treated as an enemy when he arrives in the land of another. And uh, below, he specifies a special beneficial agreement would be needed in order to give an outsider a right to become a fellow inhabitant for a certain length of time. It is only a right of temporary sojourn, a right to associate which all men have. They have it by virtue of their common possession of the surface of the earth, where, as a globe, they cannot 
infinitely disperse and hence must finally tolerate the presence of each other. Originally, no one had more right than another to a particular part of the earth. This is what Kant said about hospitality and it was very much commented on two aspects. First of all, the negative formula of hospitality in Kant. Hospitality means the right of a stranger not to be treated as an uh, enemy when he arrives in the land of the other. Second aspect, very, very much commented in political theory regarding this uh, article in Kant, is that it, just after he mentions the hospitality, he puts a limit to it for a certain amount of time, uh, for a certain length of time. So this gives uh, the people the liberty to uh, go to another country, to establish uh, commercial uh, uh, ties with people, but not to become a citizen of that country. This is what Kant wanted to prevent by this negative and limited formula of hospitality. The one who gives hospitality is the nation state, which is defined by its sovereignty, sovereignty seed, uh, seen in terms of territoriality and self-determination. This is the actor who can dispose of this law, who can give hospitality to the other. And this hospitality is limited to a certain amount of time and to a certain role the guest can acquire in a given space. One cannot become a citizen of that space. Uh, very briefly, uh, Kant had in mind, uh, he, he was very critical towards colonialism. And he considered that what Europeans do in a colonized, col colonized uh, uh, territories are that they violate this principle of hospitality. They act like citizens, although they should not act like, like citizens because the society where they go to is already formed, is already a given one with, with a structure, with an identity, with a national identity. So the European are just uh, uh, plundering uh, and he wanted to, to prevent that. But what remains from, from this first paradigm, the political paradigm, is the limited character of hospitality and the fact that who can give hospitality is the state. The state can offer someone hospitality. A second paradigm uh, is a contemporary one. I'll give a brief sketch on, on, on the facts. Uh, we find it in Jacques Derrida's uh, writings. And Jacques Derrida, in, uh, he has a, a, an article, so to speak, a, a conference, Cosmopolite de tous les pays, encore un effort. Uh, which reminds us of a, of a book written by Marx, proletarians, uh, proletarians from all the uh, countries come together. Unite. Uh, unite. But uh, I also have a brief uh, comment on that and a critic on Derrida, but I, let it, I will leave, this, leave it aside. What does Derrida speak in that, uh, in, in that text? About what happened in 1995, 1996, the International Parliament of Writers, uh, as a, a global uh, uh, association of writers, instituted, uh, uh, I'll say it in French, uh, une carte de ville refuge, a, a chart of refugee uh, cities. That is, uh, adopted a kind of regulation by allowing uh, writers who are persecuted because of their writings to find refuge in a number of cities all around the globe, among which Helsinki, Barcelona, Berlin, Paris, and so on. A lot of, of cities uh, uh, adhered to, 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 to that program. Hospitality, when it, uh, when the uh, persecution does not uh, uh, follow that person for criminal law. So if a writer is persecuted because of his writings, not because of his crimes or whatever, there is this uh, disposition uh, of, of some uh, 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 cities all around the globe to give him asylum, which is a very interesting thing. 
uh, perhaps you could uh, elaborate on that during the discussions, that this time who gives hospitality to the other is not the state. It is the city who can give this hospitality to someone against the state. If someone is uh, haunted by the state, a city can act against, uh, uh, against this uh, uh, actual treatment, statal treatment to, of, a, of a person. The second thing that uh, Derrida, and Derrida comments on that by taking into account the text of Emmanuel Levinas, starting from Emmanuel Levinas. And the second thing that is to be uh, seen in this fact, in, in this phenomena that Derrida uh, elaborates on, first of all, so it is the city, not the state. And secondly, hospitality should be unlimited. We are not talking, said Derrida, about a law, of, about laws, about a legal system that could norm uh, the hospitality, but of an unconditional law to hospitality. And he said, which I think it's very uh, well said from him, an act of hospitality can only be poetic. What is hospitality is not politics, but is experience. And when he speaks of an experience of hospitality, of an ethics of hospitality, and not of a politics of hospitality, he develops that, as, as I said, uh, uh, starting with the text of Emmanuel Levinas. Very briefly, what Emma, uh, Levinas uh, said, uh, for Levinas, uh, uh, what makes me a human being, a human subject, is the way I can be inhabited by a form of transcendence. What uh, takes me out of uh, a technical condition of, 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 of man is the way I can acquire liberty by uh, addressing myself to the transcendent and not to the immanent. Uh, I, I leave it that this, in order to speak about Levinas, I would need uh, three days, years or something. But, uh, it is this idea that uh, Derrida uh, kept in mind when reading Le Levinas that it, it is the other who makes me what I am. It is the, uh, uh, the way that I am uh, called by the other is in fact the origin of my, of my true self. Because being called by the other is, if I can, uh, let's say, uh, shift a little bit, the way of being called by the, from his text, the way of being called by the other is the um, proof that comes from outer, not, not from myself, but from outside me, that I exist. If I hear a calling, that is that I exist. And this other that can call me, can God, uh, Levinas more than one time refers to this other that as to God, and or the stranger. In, in, in this historical uh, condition of people, it is the stranger who comes to my door, who knocks on my door, and this is the, 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 the proof that I am someone because the other comes to my door, to, to me, addresses to me. Uh, and Derrida uh, observes, or, or also notices that uh, there is an old tradition of uh, city, of refuge cities which to be, is to be found in the Old Testament, in the book of Numbers and in Joshua, when God himself instituted this idea that someone is to be defended within a city uh, against the, the prosecution from his uh, own society. Uh, and, and, and this uh, uh, is uh, a divine, so to speak, uh, duty for, for man. Derrida also speaks about, what, uh, about the asylum given by the church in the Middle Age, which also bypassed the, the so, or could bypassing, could bypass the, the, the legal uh, uh, haunting from, of the state. And uh, uh, of course Derrida is not naive, he does not speak of this uh, ethics of hospitality as a given one, as, as a proper functioning uh, way of developing a, 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 a com community. 
He speaks, for example, of this unconditional law of hospitality as a critical imperative to every system of laws uh, active in each, of, in, in, in each country. So <clears throat> this idea of uh, unlimited hospitality, even if it is not acquired, in, uh, if it's not uh, uh, active in itself, in, 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 in historical societies, it, sh it uh, still should be seen as an ideal and as a difference of every law from between what it is and what it should be, even if this should be it is infinite. Uh, one last thing about uh, 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 Derrida, and I go to the third uh, paradigma. A, a very interesting thing. Uh, Derrida asks himself, what makes a stranger a stranger? What, what is the nature of a stranger? Why do we call someone a stranger? And she said, there are two elements that um, can, uh, that, that, that can uh, characterize something, someone as a stranger. Language and death. That is, the one who speaks other language than me, he is a stranger in comparison to me. And the second element, a very important one, the one who has not his ancestors buried in my place, but somewhere else. So someone is a stranger to me if his ancestors are, are not buried in my city, but uh, no, no matter where, but somewhere else. And the idea of this uh, unconditional, unlimited hospitality in Derrida is uh, 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 is addressed against this uh, the falsification of these two elements that makes a stranger a stranger. For, so, for example, if someone asks for asylum in our society, he has to address us in our language in order for us to understand him. This, said Derrida, is a falsification of, a, the, of, the, of the idea of hospitality because I am falsifying his strangeness of the other by making him speak my language. How can we address this problem? He doesn't speak in, 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 in a practical manner, but uh, his idea is I have to let him address this to me and not ask for his identity, not ask for, uh, 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 to respect my rules if I am to be hospitable towards him. The second thing, uh, the idea of death. Derrida links this idea of death with the idea of tradition. How can my tradition be unhospitable towards a stranger in the way I can make him uh, follow my laws, my uh, uh, to, to, to uh, follow my values and, and so on. This is also something that happens when someone is seeks asylum in, in today's society and Derrida said contradicts the idea of hospitality in itself, to ask from him to be like me. And in this way, he uh, uses this concept of unlimited hospitality in a critical manner, not showing us what we must do, but what is not to be done if I really want to be hospital. Uh, finally, a third concept uh, of hospitality, I will very briefly sketch it because it is a radical concept of hospitality from an author that I deal with uh, nowadays, a Romanian theologian, Andrei Scrima. Uh, he has a very interesting idea, and I won't uh, elaborate very much on that, as I said, because it is a radical idea of hospitality, as a, 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 an infinite of it, is that only a stranger, only, only the nomad, can be hospitable. Because if someone has a home, if someone has something to give to the other, automatically what he gives to the other, the show of hospitality he, 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 he makes is, that is a kind of limitation. Only the one who is a stranger who has nothing can give to the someone who could actually show to someone else hospitality because he's not showing hospitality from the point of view what he has, but from what he is. I am giving him my, uh, my being because I, like himself, 
am a stranger. And we talked yesterday, uh, Scrima mocks at, uh, the modern concept of hospitality, speaking of a Victorian uh, formula as cold as charity. What can be colder and impersonal, more impersonal than charity itself given to the other as a gift that I give from my own uh, belongings, so to speak, or, or, or like this. So, from the spiritual point of view, uh, uh, in Andres Klima, in order to be hospitable, you have to be yourself a stranger. At the limit, he said, true hospitality can only be found in the desert, not in a state and not in a city. Thank you very much. All right. Who would like to begin? Yes, show Marina. hospitality, please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> show hospitality towards me. Okay. Don't, 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 don't fight me. <laughs> what do you think about hospitality among friends? What is this, uh, the position? Because Aristotle says that friends share what they are and not something mm -hmm. that they have. From this point of view, and I think so. Yeah. I think we, we, we can speak of that, but the problem with hospitality is why would one seek hospitality? One seeks hospitality out of a need or out of a, a desire he had. If we see friendship as a tensed relationship between two or more persons, which gives uh, to one person uh, the possibility of sensing a need or to, to, to be to be in, in search of someone that he doesn't have liberty or so on in a police then I think we can see it in, in this way but if we see friendship as a stable relationship as an uh, eternal joy between people I don't think we could speak of hospitality because there's no one seeking hospitality there's no one in need of that what does Derrida say, or I think you said he said that hospitality must be unlimited? I didn't understand. Absolutely. Unconditional. Mm -hmm. Unconditional. Unconditioned and un unlimited. Uh, uh, Why though? I'm sorry. Unlimited in the sense of unconditioned, that I don't have to impose to the asylum seeker, so to speak, or hospital, hospital, hospitality seeker, any limitation, like precondition, precondition, pre pre in order to get hospitality. Yeah. To speak my language, to show me his ID, to uh, stay here for two days, not for three days, and so on. In this sense, because Derrida said, uh, uh, this limited hospitality <coughs> is the state's hospitality, and the state benefits from me from my staying for, for, from, from uh, this limited hospitality. Or at least he's not harmed by it. But in order to be truly hospitable, I, can, I have to be in a way in danger of being harmed by the other and assume that danger. As, but as I said, uh, I think it's important to see that it is the city, which is uh, not the state that is at stake in, in, in Derrida. The city gives hospitality and the city compared to the state, is a very dynamic, uh, fluid form of society compared to the state, which has a given identity. A city already uh, always acquires a new identity, is changing. A state is not. So th this is the... the uh, Mr. Bonas. I want just, first of all, to make a comment, half jokingly. Uh, with all the due respect for the imagination and the generosity of those writers who declare that some cities are to protect other writers, I have to tell you that their imagination and generosity is severely beaten by the reality in the U.S. today where you have cities defending people against their own government. You know what I mean? I mean, American cities defending people against the American government, which is, we have all to, to admit, the sanctuary cities, which is a world over it, uh, a serious step forward, you know, <laughs> in terms of hospitality. So this was just how to. 
Now, um, I would like to, to, to ask you to elaborate a little bit more on the stranger issue. Uh, because definitely in order to be hospitable, uh, first of all we have to, to define very clear to whom. Because obviously in the relationship with one of ours, being our family or whatever, our generosity is called otherwise. Is like respect, is like, uh, you know, it's, it's an obligation, mm -hmm. uh, so on. but in, in the relationship with the stranger, obviously, it's about hospitality. Mm -hmm. And I'd like you to, to, to uh, I'd like you to hear your own point of view on this issue, because to me, the definition that you just mentioned, I think of the Dao with the guy who speaks other language or uh, his ancestors are, bur are buried in other cemeteries, whatever, this is not really convincing to me. I mean, I, I'm not that convinced that this is a good definition of a stranger. Uh, we are in a country where we have a lot of philosophers that proclaim that every other human being is a stranger, basically. You know? So, uh, this is another radical uh, position, of course. But I'd like to hear your, your comment on that. Mm -hmm. Who is a stranger? Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, regarding your first... Uh, they're my joke, so, so to speak. Uh, I, I said I won't address the, the title of Derrida, and I think this is the, the weak point in his argumentation. Cosmopolite to pay and current effort, and his indebtedness towards Marxism and towards an, an anarchist uh, uh, relation to the state. With the government. Sorry. With the government. I think this is his weak point. Exactly, this is the weak point. The The... the reactive of Derrida against the, gov the government. It is something that is done against someone. It's not from itself so, or in itself, but is against someone. Secondly, uh, who is the stranger? I personally um, uh, would uh, take into account what Andres Klima, how <coughs> the way Andres Klima defines the stranger. The stranger is the one who is always, always on the move. This is his mark, or, or his, uh, the nomad is in fact a, a total stranger, because a, a total stranger. Mm -hmm. So the idea of a stranger is linked to, idea, to the idea of mobility. The one who, who has not his place, and uh, I will use this opportunity to, to speak uh, uh, something of schema. The stranger is the one who is always on the move, who has not his own place, and by this always being always on the move, he is very open to experience. He is op very open to the others and so on. And Skrima said on, uh, that uh, originally God lived in a tent, not in a temple, or at least not in a stone temple. Mm -hmm. If we, we are to find God, we find it in a tent, like a nomad tent, and not in Solomon's temple. And this idea of uh, uh, this is the idea of that a stranger can be open to God because he has not the limitation imposed by its own well-being, city, uh, courtyard relations, and so on. So stranger is mobility, and I would add loneliness. The idea of being lonely, they are not not being in a community because the uh, uh, relationship to the others is also a kind of familiarity which contradicts the idea of a stranger. You're very close by the, by the figure of the refugee, basically. Yeah. You're saying that he's somebody who, who has no whatsoever links to something that can, he can call home, because you know, he, he's not able to go there anymore, and in the same time, he's lonely. Yeah, but I, what uh, is, especially with the refugee, what, what, what is problematic with the refugees, because is the, the fact that I think they carry within with themselves their home. So they seek, for, for example, if uh, the refugees go to Germany, they tend to build their, their society as they had it at home. Their little community, their, to feel safe in a, in a foreign region, as they, was at as they were at home. Well, it's much more complicated because actually they love the German standard of living, that's why they are going there. They're not going there <laughs> to find their 
tense oh, no, oh, like from back home. You know? No, but well, uh, but yeah, yes, yes, okay, yeah. thank you very much. I don't want to monopolize. Okay, Professor San Martin. Yes, sir. I want to return to the idea of strangers. In, uh, actually, uh, in your definition, is not any kind of relativism regarding the stranger. For example, in Todorov, in America and the meeting with the Apples, uh, we have an image about the Spanish who meets the uh, Indians. Who is the stranger there? <laughs> the Indian of the yeah. Indian. They're <laughs> putting like that, you know? It's like a Spanish meeting an, Ind an Indian on an airport in Mexico. Who's the stranger yeah. there? Yeah, yeah I, 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 I totally agree with you. And I think this is also a limitation of my speech because I see the idea of a stranger as an absolute, as, as a paradigmatic figure, as, as, as an infinite uh, figure, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. In the political and yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I, uh, I can never let an occasion to criticize Derrida or or uh, <laughs> let him go. Good. Um, <laughs> So much of their philosophy works only as a trope, only as a gimmick, only as a comment on actual values that build societies and sustain societies and people. It, that's sort of the capital which it depends on. It, and that's the problem. That it, I mean, if you were to take, this works as an interesting commentary on interpersonal relationships, but fails compared to the Kantian ethic when it comes to state policy toward refugees, or state policy of immigration, for many what should be, I hope, obvious reasons, but sometimes aren't so obvious in today's political debate. But people build places. We create our humanness by building a place, by amassing property, by passing it down to one another. This makes us what we are. And that can't be lost in some uh, mystical conception of otherness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I didn't try to, to, to defend Derrida against No, no, I mean, again, I'm, only, not, uh, I'm, not, I'm not attacking you, I'm attacking them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think you were right with this uh, relationship, rela yeah, uh, perspective of May? Uh, in your opinion, what are the gypsy people in relation with, not only with Romanians, talk about uh, in relation with the Europeans? Are they strangers? And my question is related uh, with the fact that in more than 100 and a half in Romania, they didn't, they weren't assimilated to the entire, by the entire society we have, not only Romania, we can talk about Bulgaria or other countries, but again, are they strangers? If the answer is yes, why? And if not? <laughs> <laughs> if I say no, I... I get rid of the... I get rid of the why. Of the explanation. <laughs> <laughs> Just say no and pass. <laughs> well, in, in, in fact, no, and I will say why. I think they are not strangers, they are, they are citizens uh, who, has, who have uh, responsibilities, who have rights. I think the difference between them and them and us, so to speak, is not greater than the, the difference between a, a, a Romanian and a Norwegian in terms of civilization, so to speak. I, I for example, smoke and throw it on the floor. It's seen from another side of the world. What is wrong? That you smoke or that you throw it on the floor? Both, both, <laughs> both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think there are citizens with, in my opinion, you asked me, with the same rights and responsibilities as all of us. I do not see a, a proper cultural mark that would distinguish them from us. There, there is no s s strong and specific that should be cultivated by themselves in order to assume a different identity from Romanians. So they can be responsible or ir irresponsible, but not uh, foreign or... And I don't know if we can say they are not stranger anymore. 
Yeah, yeah there was. was no more. more. Yeah. yeah, in the time that we talk about how much they travel in the time that we talk about how their communities are isolated by Romanian, but talking about Romanian uh, communities, in the fact, the fact that uh, we talk about another set of values, talking about how we feel that it's our duty to have a job or to have to respect the social rules. In the time that you have communities which will tell you that it's important to be thief or to do something. But again, it's not about uh, the gypsy or Roms Romanian community. I talk about what happened in Europe, talking about the uh, gypsy yeah. community. I mean, how, how I think that how different should you could you should you be in order to be a stranger? Because of course we all of us were different. Mm -hmm. But what is that breaking point from which, in terms of differences, we become a stranger? Uh, I. Uh, well, but also this is my opinion. In today's time, uh, Petro Crezia had a, a, a word on, on exotism. There is no exotism anymore. There, there is nowhere to run anymore. The world is co com compacted like this. There is no otherness. There, there so is no. Not strangers. They are not. I think in, in today's uh, uh, society. One can be a stranger only as a personal way of seeing his relation to God, for example, or to assume its itinerancy in a, in a spiritual uh, manner. But in, as a political stranger, I don't see, at least not the gypsies, being strangers in the European context. Uh, excuse me, because you mentioned at a certain point the another kind view on the citizenship. Yeah. Of course, this, is, this belongs to a completely different philosophy that we are living today. Because today, the, the, the effort of the international community is have to, to have less people without citizenship. We have uh, a, a United Nations uh, international treaty where uh, most, all, all the countries almost oblige themselves to manage somehow to avoid the situation mm -hmm. where you have what we call an apathy, somebody ah. without citizenship. <coughs> So to cut it was something a matter of the state, you know? I can accept you to be a citizen or not. If not, you know, this is not my problem anymore. We don't have, uh, you know, the same kind of view today. Mm -hmm. when, a, when, a, when a country, for instance, is stripping somebody from its citizenship, should be absolutely sure that that one has another citizenship. You are not allowed anymore to be not to have a yes. so it's, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, last comment and then we're going to go to a coffee break. I'm really interested in your opinion. What makes a stranger lose its characteristic of a stranger based on what we talked here? Is it maybe mm -hmm. the roots they have onto a place or the things they possess or the fact that they meet another person and when they meet and they talk, they stop being a stranger? When you lose mm -hmm. your characteristic as a stranger? Uh, I also give the, the, the answer of Screma in, in, in this respect. You stop being a stranger when you stop wondering yourself. When stop you, wandering? Uh, me, uh, to, to, to see when things as wonders. Somewhere. When you settle somewhere? No. Not, not exactly when you settle. Amazed, as being amazed when you, you, when when you stop ah, being amazed. 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 Oh, okay. That means you get familiar with the world. And it's when you get familiar. Choice to make, not the other. It's a state you acquire, not exactly. Okay, choice. ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have a coffee break. We're going to come back. <laughs> <laughs>